Hey, how's it going? Given the reception of my first video covering the first three levels of this iceberg, I thought I'd go ahead and make another video covering the remaining two levels, which in all honesty should be a lot more interesting than the previous video. However, I do want to preface this video and say that the items on this list tend to be less characterized pharmacologically and clinically. So in general, what I say here will be of less certainty than the previous video. Not that psychopharmacology is a particularly certain science, but you get what I mean. All right, let's get into it. Level 4 is comprised of drugs that have unique mechanisms of action, some even being the only drugs known to possess that mechanism. In other cases, the mechanism of the drug is entirely unclear, as it may not interact with any known biological targets, so it can only be assumed that the drug works by a novel mechanism, but exactly how is unknown. One such drug is methaquilone, a mixed allosteric modulator of the GABA-A receptor which binds to a yet-to-be-discovered allosteric site distinct from benzodiazepines, ethanol, neurosteroids or barbiturates. Its pharmacological activities at different GABA-A subtypes range from positive, negative, inactive and super agonistic with the majority of its actions being positive allosteric modulation, potentiating the effects of GABA at the alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3 and alpha-5 containing subtypes of the GABA-A receptor. For some context, alpha-1 is most implicated in the sedative effects of benzodiazepines and alpha-2 is most implicated in anxiety. It was a popular club drug in the late 1960s to 70s and because of the Wolf of Wall Street is actually surprisingly well known to this day. Attempts were made by the South African apartheid regime to weaponize the drug as a riot control agent, with an aerosol form of the drug actually being developed, but it's uncertain if the drug was ever weaponized outside of testing. Ramonabad is an inverse agonist of the cannabinoid 1 receptor. This receptor is the target of the partial agonist THC. Through inverse agonism, Ramonabad essentially evokes the opposite response of THC at the same receptor. The drug was probably inspired by the munchies, an acute appetite enhancement associated with the intake of THC. It was hypothesized that inverse agonism of this receptor could be therapeutically useful in the treatment of obesity. The drug was effective at reducing food food intake, but caused psychiatric disturbances in a third of all patients, with four patients in the Ramona Band group committing Initially, this effect was attributed to its inverse agonism of the cannabinoid receptor. However, it was later discovered that Ramonabant was an antagonist to the mu opioid receptor. It's unknown to what degree this may have contributed to the neuropsychiatric side effects of the drug. Fluorinol is a putative eugeroic drug that was determined as a lead candidate for the second generation modafinil by the pharmaceutical company Cephalon, the marketer of modafinil in the United States. Like modafinil, it is a weak dopamine reaction uptake inhibitor, being about 60% weaker than modafinil in this action, but 40% more effective than modafinil at keeping mice awake over a 4 hour period. Like modafinil, its precise mechanism of action pertaining to its eugeroic effects is unknown. On the topic of eugeroics, there's pitolescent, an inverse agonist of the histamine 3 receptor, an autoreceptor for histamine primarily located in the central nervous system. By inverse agonizing this receptor on presynaptic neurons, Patolosat essentially tricks the neuron into sensing a scarcity of histamine in the synapse, prompting it to release histamines to counteract this false signal. Because histaminergic pathways in the brain are heavily involved in wakefulness, it's thought that this increase in histaminergic tone is responsible for its eugeroic effect. However, unlike other eugeroics which are not entirely selective for wakefulness, inducing at least a mild stimulant phenotype, Petolosant is comparatively void of psychostimulant properties, having no effect on striatal dopamine, locomotion or food intake in animal models and lacking behavioral sensitization to its effects. In human beings, Petolosant displays no effect on drug liking compared to placebo and can perhaps be considered the first pure eugeroic to reach the market. Interesting it's also been shown that Petolosant has a high binding affinity for Sigma-1 and Sigma-2 receptors, as well as moderate binding to 5-HT2A and Dopamine 3. However, there are conflicting in vitro results for its activity at 5-HT2A. Celtorexant is a second generation orexa antagonist in clinical development for the treatment of insomnia and depression. 
The orexin system is heavily involved in wakefulness promotion, and the selective destruction of orexin neurons is now known to underlie the pathology of narcolepsy. Therefore, first-generation orexin antagonists were developed as a selective means of inducing sleep. Unlike almost all other drugs which have been used in the treatment of insomnia, orexin antagonists increase total sleep time primarily by promoting REM sleep and shorten the latency to the first REM episode. Like the orexin antagonists that came before it, such as Lemborexant or Devigo, Celtorexant is selective for the orexin 2 receptor and possesses a much shorter half-life of 2-3 to three hours. The motivation to create an orexin 2 selective antagonist was spurred on by initial findings suggesting that orexin 1 antagonism was responsible for the REM promoting effects of orexin antagonists. However, later findings have contradicted this hypothesis and it does not appear that orexin 2 selective antagonism differentially affects sleep stage is relative to dual orexin antagonism. Nonetheless, celtorexin likely possesses a unique clinical advantage relative to first-generation drugs in that its onset and duration of action appear more in line with what would be expected of a drug used to treat insomnia, while the frequency of daytime somnolence in clinical trials for first-generation orexin antagonists is typically around 10-15%, to despite the half-lives of these drugs often being in excess of 12 hours. A shorter-acting orexin antagonist may be favorable as it may allow for middle of the night dosing and shorter sleep periods without impairment upon waking. Realistically, patients are not always going to allow 9 hours of sleep opportunity, so a duration of action that is more in line with Zalplon or Zolpidem might be more suited to real world applications. Bemethyl, also known as bemethyl, is a purported anti-hypoxant, anti-mutagenic, and actoprotector drug. The term actoprotector roughly meaning synthetic adaptogen, defined by their purported ability to protect against environmental and psychological stressors via a non-exhaustive action. Of all the mystery Soviet superdrugs, it is perhaps the least characterized with regards to its pharmacological mechanism. The hypotheses presented in the Russian literature postulate that the drug may work at a transcriptional level, influencing the synthesis of various proteins and glucose metabolism, in addition to antioxidant activity. The drug was provided to rescue teams and other workers deployed in the wake of the Chernobyl disaster, in the hopes of protecting against the mutagenic effects of radioactive material found at the hazard site, as well as a performance enhancing drug in the Soviet special forces, especially on missions which involved hypoxic and high temperature conditions. Following the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, the official manufacture and clinical use of bimetal was discontinued. However, it continued to be used as a performance and recovery enhancing drug in the preparation of Ukrainian national teams for the Olympics. In 2018, bimethyl was added to the monitoring program of the World Anti-Doping Agency. However, in the 2024 WADA guidelines, the drug is neither listed in the monitoring program or the prohibited list. I could find no official statement that the drug was removed from the program, so it's unclear if this recent omission indicates that the drug is no longer monitored or that its monitoring status has remained unchanged. This is rather surprising as meldonium, another drug that has been encountered as a doping agent in international competitions, mainly in the national teams of ex-Soviet states, was also placed on the monitoring program before being upgraded to a prohibited drug. Evidence of the drug's anti and recovery enhancing properties is rather scarce outside of the Soviet literature, so it's understandable if it cannot be clearly discerned whether or not the drug does offer an unfair advantage in competition, but I find it strange that in the context of doping, the drug is not treated as guilty before innocent. Phenethylamine plus selegiline, also known as phenethylamine replacement therapy, refers to a highly experimental antidepressant drug combination that appears to have had some attention in psychiatric spaces around the mid-1990s. As the name implies, the treatment involved the combination of the monoamine oxidase B-class inhibitor selegiline and the trace amine phenethylamine. Phenethylamine is an endogenous agonist of TAR1 and is the molecule upon which all alpha-methylated phenethylamines, also known 
as amphetamines are based. Phenethylamine emerged as a biological correlate for depression around the time when substantial doubt was being cast on the monoamine hypothesis as a fundamental explanation of depression pathophysiology rather than an idiosyncratic symptom. Low PEA levels in urine were correlated with depression symptomology in some early studies, and so a new hypothesis emerged that a deficit in PEA activity could be a common cause of depressive illness. However, direct supplementation of PEA would not prove viable, as the drug is extensively metabolized following oral administration, particularly by monoamine oxidase B. Selegiline being a monoamine oxidase B class inhibitor dramatically attenuates the metabolism of phenethylamine, allowing it to reach the blood-brain barrier much more readily. When bioprotected, phenethylamine takes on amphetamine-like characteristics, presumably due to its ability to activate TAR1, a target known to be involved in the releasing agent action of amphetamine. The action of oral phenethylamine is potentiated to such an extreme extent that the drug goes from being largely inactive below the gram level to a potent psychostimulant comparable to moderate doses of amphetamine at only 50 to 60 milligrams. Given the rapidly changing theoretical landscape surrounding depression at the time, the PEA hypothesis was in and out of the zeitgeist rather quickly. Three clinical explorations involving some 46 patients all of whom were treated with phenethylamine in regimens lasting 3 to 50 weeks. The remission rate produced by phenethylamine ranged from 60 to 80 percent, with all studies reporting a rapid and sustained antidepressant response that did not vary in intensity throughout the trial durations. The authors of one of these studies went on to claim that phenethylamine improved mood as rapidly as amphetamine, but did not produce tolerance or dependence to its effects. It's important to note that none of these studies were controlled and represent preliminary clinical findings that were ultimately never replicated. I find the treatment regimen of these trials to be especially interesting, as given the short duration of action of phenethylamine's psychotropic effects, even in combination with an MAOI, the patients only experienced amphetamine-like effects for less than an hour a day, yet reported persistent antidepressant efficacy without major side effects. In a way, this treatment regimen is comparable to modern-day ketamine, but on a much shorter time frame. It's unknowable if this was the actual dynamic at play, or if the very obvious and unblinded amphetamine-like effect was what underlied the perceived antidepressant efficacy in these patients. Bromo Dragonfly, the drug I've had pasted on the thumbnail for the past two videos, is a high-potency phenethylamine agonist of the serotonin 2A and 2C receptors, as well as a moderate-potency agonist of the 2B receptor that produces psychedelic effects exceeding 48 hours in duration. This is believed to be due to its ability to inhibit MAO-A, thereby resisting its own metabolism and allowing it to remain in what seems to be a difficult-to-excrete state. Around the 2010s, an incident involving the mislabeled of 2CB fly, a related psychedelic phenethylamine with a much shorter half-life, led to several deaths and many other instances of psychosis associated with the drug. Its lethality may be a combination of its exceptionally long duration of action with its MAOI and serotonin agonist activity. Given its affinity for the known anti-target that is the 5-HT2B receptor and its unusually high affinity for 5-HT2C as compared to 5-HT2A relative to most psychedelic drugs. Drugs. Tabernantholog is a creatively named analog of the psychoactive alkaloid tabernantine present in the ethnogen plant Tabernanta iboga. Ibogaine, another alkaloid derived from Tabernanta iboga, has received much attention in the treatment of drug addiction. However, whole extracts of the plant are known to be highly cardiotoxic due to its inhibition of cardiac herg potassium channels. The ibogaine experience has also been reported to be rather unpleasant and highly hallucinogenic. Therefore, the development of a drug void of these cardiotoxic and psychotomimetic effects while retaining this purported anti-drug drug addiction efficacy was a key motivator in the development of tabernantholog. Compared to its structural analogs found in tabernante iboga, tabernantholog loses much of its affinity to opioid, nicotinic, and sigma receptors, and gains specificity for various serotonin receptor subtypes. Its most notable action is at serotonin 2A, where despite being an agonist, it does not produce responses that would indicate psychedelic hallucinations in animals. In rodents, it was found to promote neuronoplasticity represented by increased dendritic arborization. It also produced antidepressive and anti-addictive effects in these animals and has thus been characterized as a non-hallucinogenic psychoplastogen. Amphichloral 
is a pretty accurate representation of 1960s psychopharmacology. It likely behaves as a prodrug to amphetamine and amphichloral, amphetamine needing no introduction, and chlorohydrate being an archaic sedative and hypnotic drug. It's not hard to see why this is such an interesting combination, as a major sedative with a psychostimulant is far from a first-line treatment these days. It's especially interesting to see how the drug was described as a selective appetite suppressant, purportedly void of psychostimulant properties. The prevailing attitudes and beliefs at the time were so different than what they are today, and it's especially apparent in old papers describing amphetamine analogs of the time, with one paper describing amphetamine as a drug with limited medical applications outside of its use as an appetite suppressant. What's more is that it's astonishing to think that the amphetamine anorectic trend, although on a lesser scale, persisted into the late 2010 with the recent advent of GLP-1 agonist unofficially putting this era to an end. Zerproxetine is a major metabolite of the antidepressant fluoxetine, also known as Prozac. Like its parent compound, at higher doses it inhibits the reuptake of serotonin, but at doses that do not have appreciable effects on serotonin reuptake, it is four times more selective at stimulating the synthesis of the neurosteroid allopregnanolone, a neurosteroid known to have positive allosteric modulatory effects on the GABA-A receptor, as well as sedative and anxiolytic effects. Both fluoxetine and surproxetine have been described as selective brain serotogenic stimulants, an action that is thought to be highly relevant to their paradoxically quick efficacy in the treatment of premenstrual dysphoric disorder. For some context, the efficacy of SSRIs in depression is typically delayed by two to four weeks following the initiation of therapy. However, in PMDD, SSRIs like fluoxetine appear to exert their therapeutic effects in a matter of days. The standard dose range of fluoxetine in PMDD and depression is known to be active on the reuptake inhibition of serotonin and is likely far greater than dosages which would be selective for the stimulation of allopregnanolone synthesis. I find this especially interesting as complaints associated with SSRIs like fluoxetine, such as sexual dysfunction and nausea, are probably attributed to their serotogenic effects. It's possible that low-dose fluoxetine or surproxetine on its own could take on a therapeutic profile distinct from higher doses, maintaining efficacy for conditions like PMDD and potentially other psychiatric conditions, while at the same time improving their side effect profile and tolerability. Given the relatively recent attention given to neurosteroids as potential therapeutic agents in the treatment of various psychiatric disorders, it would be interesting to see if the solicitation of endogenous neurosteroid synthesis could itself be a viable avenue. The potential of such an agent to have a better therapeutic index and efficacy relative to exogenously administered neurosteroids would likely solicit further investigation provided the clinical and of course financial success of first generation neurosteroids. Alright, I'm gonna end the video here, because honestly if I kept going this video would never come out, leaving us with the deepest level of the iceberg to cover in the next video. I'm very grateful for how the first video was received, and it's definitely nice to have an audience that isn't on TikTok, even if making YouTube videos tends to take a lot longer than my TikTok videos, because there's a lot more editing and admittedly willpower involved in making them. But if somehow you haven't already grown tired of my incoherent rambles, then you should check out my TikTok. I have have a lot of cool videos there. I highly recommend the best of Yapmat playlist and the uh, slideshows I've made. Let me know how I did with this video and stay safe and do research. Don't stocks.